Oh. Okay, we are live. Welcome Facebook, Facebook Live. It's so wonderful to be here tonight. Welcome, welcome everyone. My name is Sharada. I'm the founder and the heart of the Be Woman Project and Devi School. Be Woman Project is a sacred movement to bring women together or those that identify with being a woman to reestablish the sacred bond we once had once upon a time to neutralize competition and jealousy through support and sacred contribution. And Devi School is our beautiful online goddess school where spirituality needs embodiment, which many of you have been part and joined our programs and I feel so excited to on this almost full moon continue or start with our Davis voice session that we're going to have every other week we're going to have amazing women just like Dr. Shari here with us <laughs> that are going to share the their passion and life's work all women that have dedicated their life or parts of their life to reclaim the sacred feminine and we are also offering this specific talk which is called the conquered feminine the demonization dedicated especially to the demonization of the word witch and those that were called witches and also looking into the story of the burning times we have this as a beautiful opportunity to also share with you and invite you to our upcoming rising witch a two months online live sacred sexuality course and natural remedy that is starting in may which i invite you with all my heart i have the best teachers at my side along with dr shari and i will talk about that invitation at the end of this of this discourse so now i feel yes excited <laughs> Like Dr. Shari is here with me. We met under such wonderful, beautiful, sacred alignment. I was doing a cervical wellness or cervical awakening course with Dr. Jenny Martin, not Leila Martin, another Martin, a beautiful doctor and sex educator. I was on my journey on reclaiming my cervix and part of her content in that course one of the texts was the dissertation the conquered feminine by dr shari tarbet and i i love that dissertation so much so i went on a research adventure trying to find dr shari and somehow the goddess brought us together and that was a little bit more than yeah i mean i did the course i think two or three years ago and then maybe one year ago we got to meet i got to meet dr shari and since then, she has joined our Universe Festival last year. You maybe remember she has joined us through in the, Nav in the Navaratri, the Nine Nights of the Goddess Festival that we are going to do again this year. And she also has joined us in the Priestess Initiation Training. And she's a Druid Priestess. And she's also here now starting or continuing our Davis Voice and also will be part of our Rising Witch course. And so such a yeah, warm, heartfelt welcome, Dr. Shari. It's such a yeah, treat to have you here. I know it's really early in Albuquerque, if I say that correctly, where you are. I'm in Bali, so for me it's yes, evening. You did, you yes. Yeah, good. Yes. <laughs> so good to have you with us again. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Mm, I'm happy to hear that. So I, I will read to you a little bit but from the bio of Dr. Shari. So Dr. Shari has a PhD and she has been an educator for over 30 years. She taught English, history, literature and grammar at both the middle school and high school levels in Lawrence, Kansas and Albuquerque. After earning her PhD, she taught at the Navajo Nations Dying College for six years. She has been presenting lectures, courses and presentations in various topics on the sacred feminine in myth and history for 14 years with the Osher Institute, AAR, MITCON, Southwest American Pop Culture Conference, 
and Southwest Writers Workshop. Shar is now working on her book, The Conquered Feminine, Evidence of the Demonization of the Feminine in Language. And in addition, her poetry has appeared in poetry anthologies, and she's currently working on two books of poetry, Things My Cats Have Told Me, and one tentatively titled Ruminations. <laughs> They sound so witchy. I can't wait to, to read them when they, when they come out. <laughs> and I would say she's not only a priestess and a doctor, I think she's definitely a, a witch as well. Would you consider yourself to be a witch? <laughs> yes, I would. Yes, I would. <laughs> Warm welcome, Dr. Shari, witch and druid priestess and a scholar of the sacred feminine and yes please share a little bit how did you come to this journey of reclaiming the sacred feminine through language that's such an a, an interesting question um this really began amazingly i was just thinking about this the other day about 30 years ago believe it or not and um a friend of mine and I signed up for a retreat with a, he for all intents and purposes was a Welsh Druid priest. He called himself a Welsh wizard. And as part of this retreat, we did a lot of active imagination. Um, so he was, you know, guiding us through that. And all of a sudden I went off on my own track, which is always good. Uh, wondering, you know, how is it possible that you can have a root word like mag, M-A-G, and it can combine with other parts to either end up being a, a very positive word, a very good word, or a very negative word, like with mag, with which just means knowledge, you can, it can become magi, like the three wise men in the Christian Christmas story, or it can be attached to magic or magician, which has historically not had the same positive um, connotations as Magi has. So I started thinking more and more about this, and that led me to several words in English that have very negative connotations but when i started researching them turned out to have very holy and sacred meanings associated with goddess worship some of those are <laughs> bitch which of course is one of my favorites um and that was a uh, bitch comes from the fact that the dog has been a sacred totem animal for the goddess from very very early on so she had that as a title the bitch goddess and it meant very good things since the dog was not just the guardian of of the goddess's portal but also uh, was associated with her lunar aspects because dogs bay at the moon and also is associated with her crone aspect because in many traditions uh dogs accompany the crone goddess when she goes out at night to to gather the souls of the dead in celtic mythology there's the tradition of dogs going out with um the crone aspect the morrigan uh to gather the dead souls after after battle so that's one another mm -hmm. another one is um there, there are many, which is another one. <laughs> let's, let's go to which. Okay, which is another one uh, because it, it's in its original meanings, it means a wise, from its original meanings, um, can, means wise person, wise woman, uh, the Celtic Wicca, wise woman, or the Celtic Wicca, wise man. It also means knowing or knowledge, so that what what <clears throat> who the original witches were were all priestesses. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that so 
this this word is very very ancient the um the original roots that i know of came from proto-indo-european and indo-european languages these were people who lived on the russian steppes in eurasia and then migrated away from there and down into the aegean it, it, those people went in three different directions. They, they went south into the Aegean, east in more into Asia, um, and then kind of north and west into the Northwest Europe of, of the peoples that became the Norse. And so they, they carried those, those, their language with them. And then that language, particularly in the Aegean, well, yeah, in the Aegean, it became associated with these priestesses because the Indo-Europeans were patriarchal people. So their head god was a thunder warrior god. And they encountered matriarchal cultures who were engaged in goddess worship and the women were the priestesses, the leaders, uh, owned their own property, had had um, were fully independent, could transfer property, were sought for their wisdom and their advice, participated in choosing who would be the consort of the leader, <clears throat> because his job would be to, whereas the goddess and the priestess as the embodiment of the goddess was, was the embodiment of the land and therefore represented the fertility of the land and the people and the animals. And her consort would be responsible for protecting all of that and ensuring the continued health and fertility of the people, the land and the animals. So, so when the patriarchal people moved in and literally they weren't just migrating, they were invading and conquering they needed to control the story mm -hmm. and to do that they needed to take away the power of women and so then one of the ways is to change the meaning of the words and which priestess at which and then another word that goes with that whore the words that they found in not just the Aegean, but also Semitic people that came up into the Middle East um, in the Akkadian language, Khar, which meant wise woman or priestess or, or dedicated to the goddess or, or God, but dedicated to the divine. And so these words became um, demonized by the invaders to take away the power from women, to, to transfer it to a patriarchal system and to maintain it. Mm. So that's how I got involved in all of that. Yes. What from a there, you know, and, and yeah. actually I had started all that research before then that I went ahead and pursued the PhD and yeah. then took all this research and it became the dissertation, so. Mm. So and that's how I got, that's how, that's how it came about. So, yeah, yeah. And to look back and to go, wow, that started 30 years ago. That's really pretty amazing. Mm. Yeah. Yes, it is. And it's, it's so, when we think about that, these words, bitch, whore, which, that they all had a sacred meaning. It, of course they had, but then another part still, like so many of us, the majority relates to those words as a condescending word, a meaning, and as a swear word. It's it's so much alive in our culture, and to really be able to see that word as a with the connotation, with the true meaning that it has, that takes time. Like, like how do you when you hear now the word, do you feel you really have embodied that? You can like. And like I just know from my own process, from my own journey, it takes time to really feel totally one with the word. <laughs> and 
Yes, yes, I know exactly what you're saying. Um, when I was still teaching high school, uh, two things happened that helped me embody that. One, anytime I was called a bitch, I thanked the person for it. <laughs> and they all went, what? And I go, well, you don't, you know, and then they'd get a lesson on why that I was thanking them. And then also too, um, so always been kind of rebellious and witchy, but I would tell my high school students because I would get called a bitch by some students because I would because want to know why they called school. you a bitch. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was do? rather old school. Mm. <laughs> you know, I had my expectations and by golly, you better better work to live up to them. Mm. And, but I would tell them at the beginning of the year, I go, I know that this is going to happen. And I have to share with you, unless I, if I'm not called a bitch at least once a day, I don't feel like I've done my job. <laughs> so I claim the word. Mm. I took the power of the word at the beginning of the year and owned it. Mm. And, and um, that changed their perception of how I was going to receive being called a bitch, that I would be proud to be mm. called a bitch because because that meant I was doing something right. The same mm. thing with the with which mm. um because sometimes they wouldn't go all the way to bitch. They would kind of, you know, go, uh think that okay, well I'm not going to call her that. I'll just call her a witch and that's a milder thing. Well, I have friends that call me a weather witch. Again, I've embodied the term as priestess. Mm. And 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 this I do do seem to have a connection with, and it, I am connected with nature, and that's that's another part of of um, embodying which is mm. is your strengthening your connection to nature, and uh, being intuitive and picking up and feeling and knowing what nature is doing regardless of what people are saying it's doing. And, and so I've sort of like over a longer period, more like 50 years, gained this, this connection to weather where I can feel sometimes two or three days out what's coming in. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm usually... <laughs> Not to brag or anything, but I'm usually more accurate than the weather people because <laughs> 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 they're what they're doing. There's nothing wrong with what they're doing. They're following the science, and that's good. Mm. But but sometimes you need to just look outside the window and go, oh, it's raining. <laughs> you know, not not you know a thirty percent chance. No, it's really raining. So mm -hmm. so you know part mm. part of being woman is is reclaiming these words mm -hmm. and in, in a sense embodying them and being proud and thanking somebody for saying thank you for recognizing that that in me mm. beautiful <laughs> and it does it does take time mm -hmm. a little you know baby steps yeah. and then it becomes more natural just more part of how you live in the world yeah 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 and what i notice now so much also there is a, a, a maybe proud is like the the closest word that come even though it can have sometimes also a little bit the derogative connotation oh you're proud like but i don't mean it in that sense i mean more as a self-esteem like, like oh i'm a witch or priestess that feels very meaningful i feel I love to embody it as such, but when I think that yes. I had to answer somebody, who are you? What do you do? Well, I work as an administrator. It's like, okay, <laughs> I didn't really, but it wasn't that same meaning and depth and proudness to be able to say that. And now when it, when, when it comes right. to that, there's, there's so much meaning and there's truth to it. And there is the priestess that is in service to the sacred, the witch that is one with her, innate powers and and mother nature like you said so beautiful there it's there's so much meaning and and can give so much yeah self-esteem and and and, and depth back and and power. it's healing 
It's so uh, healing. You know, um, you know, part of what priestesshood and witchhood is about is mm. healing. Mm. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> and it begins with healing within. Yeah. And and as that healing of old wounds and trauma take place and one becomes more and more in touch with one's core mm. the goddess core mm -hmm. <laughs> that one's core self one's true authentic self and it goes beyond confidence and belief it goes into knowing 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 who mm. you are and knowing that you are who you are and full acceptance of that. And when those things happen, there, there's, a, there's a switch mm. to, to claim your priestesshood and witch and bitchiness is a natural, it becomes natural, a natural expression of who you are and um, living in the world that way confidently securely you don't care what you know okay so you think i'm a bitch big whoop <laughs> okay yes i am let's move on <laughs> um and and that those words no longer have power over us to arm to yeah. intimidate to control yeah. because we've taken the power we've claimed the power of those words the original power of those words into ourselves and mm -hmm. that power resides within and we live from that power base mm -hmm. and and for me that's why it has become so important to learn the, the true meanings the original meanings of those words and to understand what they came out of um to to build on because see when i've as i've researched these words I have gone to what other people, both men and women, have uncovered about these words. More, of course, more women are working primarily with that than, than men. So there are other women who have, who have laid the foundation and I'm adding to that. But um, so I, words are power. Words do have power. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, um, so it's been my goal to reclaim those words and that power as much as I, as much as I can. Mm. Yeah, and that. Yeah, and so, so with, the, with the Vedic tradition, because it's in the Vedic or in the Vedanta, it's it's all about the words. It's really the word that is going to reveal knowledge. Like through words, we can gain knowledge, and words are meant to create love and life. Yes, truth. Yes, love. yes. And, Yes, and so on the, the 8th of May, um, so what I will go into deeper is that whole history of, of which mm -hmm. from, from the Indo-European and Proto-Indo-European roots and, and talk about, you know, its origins. I, I, I'm fascinated with the origins of things, the beginnings, and then how did they get changed? And now, how do we, how, and, and now, even though it, for me, came into English in a certain way, um, how do we change that? Yeah. Even in the face yeah. of backlash to try to keep us from changing it. Mm. So, you, you know, at, uh, I'm sorry? What do you mean with that, even in the face of backlash? Uh, okay, so, you know, in this country and perhaps in, in the West in general, um, in this country, there's a backlash against women. Hmm. Um, there's here in this country is the abortion issue and hmm. men are trying to to make that a criminal act again mm -hmm. like it used to be <clears throat> and even even if there's a miscarriage 
in Texas, they're trying to make that a crime, mm -hmm. a punishable by prison sentence, um, voting rights. Uh, men in positions of political power are trying to take those things away from women and in this country and return us to a time well, when I was in college is when abortion became legal in this country. Uh, so I've, I lived through that fight. I've lived through the fact that women could seek abortion safely and legally. And now I'm living through men thinking they have the right to take that away from women, that, that men have the right to control women uh, their lives, their bodies, their decisions, everything. So that's what I mean about backlash in this country. And, and it's part of a whole political movement. Um, and of course, in this country, we have extremists in that, in that arena who, who believe in violence to achieve their ends. So, <laughs> So, so that's, so that's what I mean about pushback in this country. I don't know what it's like in Europe or in Bali or basically any other country outside of, of this one. Um, I just know that we are experiencing pushback and yet we, we have to remain strong hmm. and continue okay. and Live the live the truth. Live the stories. Know have the knowledge. Not not lose it. Not yeah. lose it, but use it. Yes, exactly. And that's what we're doing. Also, like that's why we're we're using the knowledge with reverence and and get out of the ignorance that is there. I mean, in Vedanta, we say like it's really the fun. The problem is ignorance, and so if yes. we want to get rid of ignorance, we gotta have knowledge and. That's right. So. <laughs> I agree. Com completely, completely. Yes. And, and actually the, the knowledge about which and the burning times. Yes. And, and you say um, a, a little bit to give a little hint and a little taste teaser taster of what is going to come in our rising witch program. Would you share well, a little bit about the word the witch and, and that it's not really a myth. I mean, some women, they will, if I tell them, you know, that there's millions or hundred thousands, nobody, I mean, I hear so many different numbers. Some say a million, some say 10,000, others say 50,000. Women were burned because they gathered. Because, or, they, right. or had, because they were women. Or because they, they were, were burned women. because- People right, don't believe it were, still, some. <laughs> right. The numbers, yeah. the numbers that I know are mm. some, somewhere between eight and nine million mm. people were burned as convicted witches. 85% yeah. of that number was women. The other 15% were men and children. Mm. In, in, some, in some small villages, particularly in France, um, where these monks would go in as witch hunters, by the time they left, there would be nothing female left alive. I and mean, this includes animals that, you know, if you're a female woman or child, you're a witch. If you're a female animal, you're a witch because you probably shapeshifted and you're trying to escape. And, and, and in some, and in at least one, if not two small villages in France, when these, when these witch hunters left, no one was left alive. They had killed everyone. Um, and what were they, how were they doing that? How were they deciding that someone was a witch or not? They, there was a handbook and it's called the Malleus Maleficarum, uh, the Hammer of Witches. And it was written by two monks. And it's a handbook for how, you know, how, how, what, how do you question? What are the signs? How do you know that you found a witch? Um, and, and I mean, it's extensive. Um, it explains why women are more 
susceptible to being witches and their the connection to the Christian uh, devil, which is a whole nother conversation. Um, uh, but I go in, I go in, I'll be talking about the Malleus Maleficarum and some specific things that, that um, are in there, just a few specific things that are in there. And that became sanctioned by, um, it became sanctioned in the 1400s is when they wrote that by whatever Pope was Pope at the time. So there's some of that. And how did that get started? Well, women as healers had been pretty much left alone because they were the only source of healing around. And, and it didn't, it wasn't until heresy, another one of those words, heresy just means to believe differently from whatever the mainstream is. So in 1232, whatever Pope was Pope then, declared goddess worship and everything that, that, that women had been doing as heresy, as being against the church. And, and some sources say the reason why that happened is that men who were being trained to be doctors and they were being trained by the church were complaining that women, that women, they were in competition with these women healers. So it became an institutionalized way to remove competition from Catholic doctrine and from men who were practicing as doctors. But if you know anything about the level of medicine at the time, it was extremely superstitious and included things like bloodletting which was more harmful than it did good and that they really didn't know what they were doing but but in the burning times this that's when this happened and between the 15th and 18th centuries 300 years is when this witch hunting and the burnings took place as a matter of fact the last laws in england were not removed from the books until the 20th century wow. where it was still legal to burn a woman legally accused of witchcraft it was still a crime in the 20th so century. yeah so i will be covering that i'll be covering um the priestesshood beforehand and then how things evolved as Christianity, monotheism came came into being. Um, what's what's said in the Old Testament? What's said in the New Testament? How that was carried on, and um, where we are today. Um, the negative connotations of which came into English around nine hundred of the Common Era. So so it's. Its negative connotations have been used and practiced in English since then. So that's over. It's over a thousand years. Yeah. You know, it's over a thousand years, and and of course the whole demonization process has been taking place over a period of seven thousand years. Um, patriarchy beginning to come into the fore around, um, well, 7,000 years of uh, 5,000 years, 3,500 BCE is where we really see things being, being switched from matri matrifocal to patrifocal. Mm -hmm. And then that happens. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what we'll hear about. <laughs> Yes, and why we're going to hear about that is because we may think, like some of you may be thinking, but why does that matter? This has happened so long time ago, and that's a very valid I, thought yeah. and concern. You know, that that's mm -hmm. that's one of the things that that I thought about. You know, why did it matter to me? Mm. I was so surprised when I began to discover what these words really meant, and and that our knowledge of it had been so suppressed and and then 
our training of both men and women have been to believe that the meanings of words like witch and bitch and whore and cunt and twat and I can go on and on and on, but that the, that we've been raised to believe that how we understand those words today, that has been what the meaning has always been. Mm -hmm. So when I began to discover that, no, that is not, that's not the original meanings and this is how they got changed. And this is why they got changed. And I'm just like one of these people that when I know something, I, I want everybody to know it too. And I'm going, no, we need to, this is, this affects the lives of everyone, not just women, men as well. But of course it's most affects women because, because all of these words and the history that goes along with that have been put in place to keep us in a particular place. That's not really natural. And, and it has to do with being controlled, patriarchal cultures wanting to control women out of fear and, and ignorance, mm -hmm. out of fear and mm -hmm. ignorance. And, and then men being raised to believe that they have a entitled place in, in society but that to have that entitled place and to maintain it, one has to do two things. One has to fit into the, the patriarchal hierarchy and one has to treat women a certain way to make that hierarchy stay in power, in power. Mm -hmm. And in this country, of course, when Trump was president, oh my goodness. <laughs> um, Oh my goodness, he was, that whole thing was such a display of this kind of fear and an insistence on entitlement of white male supremacy, having power over everything else and everyone else falling into line beneath that. So, so it's so important to have this knowledge, it matters that this happened in history and and that that it needs to stop happening it needs to stop continuing um and it's to the benefit not of just women but definitely the benefit of women but the benefit of everyone and quite frankly the benefit of the entire planet because because power and control some of how that translates as far as the planet goes, as far as the environment goes, is, is an idea of ownership that the planet is, and, and women and children are nothing more than property. And that when the planet is nothing more than property, that humans are entitled to exploit it and use it any way they want to. And that has led to the kind of where we are right now with global warming, with destruction of climate, with the disappearance of some species of plants and animals. And, and this somehow, this belief somehow that we are not nature, that we are not part of nature and that we are not just separate from it, but somehow not affected by what happens in nature, which is completely untrue. <laughs> <laughs> and it all comes it all comes out of of this last five to seven thousand years of of process and progress of patriarchal view of things that is supported um, whether it be a polytheism or a monotheism but it's supported um, through the idea of at the head of the pantheon being a warrior thunder god and, um, who is about, who is not, who creates out of nothing rather than, than in the creation, creation stories uh, in goddess worship where creation happens out of the cosmic womb, out of this, literally out of the sacred feminine. And, mm -hmm. um, 
and and we see old myths back 3500 BCE in Sumeria and Babylonia where a thunder god comes in and kills the goddess and recreates creation out of her body and says look at what a good boy I am I did this originally or in the Judeo-Christian tra uh, tradition in which that God does basically the same thing, that those creation stories are pretty much taken from this Sumerian Babylonian tale between a battle of the god Marduk and the goddess Tiamat, uh, who, what, whose, whose avatar was a serpent. So that's where we start to get the demonization of serpent too. And then, and then literally the Hebrew word that relates to Tiamat is transferred into the Old Testament. And we have that, the Old Testament God, defeating a serpent known as Leviathan and, and killing the serpent and then supposedly recre recreating, because the serpent was there apparently beforehand. And then suddenly there's nothingness and God is able to create out of, out of nothing. <laughs> and subdue, subdue mm -hmm. chaos, make creation linear rather than cyc cyclical, which in Mother, God in Mother Goddess traditions, life is a cycle, birth, life, death, rebirth. And it comes out of the cosmic womb, <clears throat> is manifest and returned to be renewed and then reborn. And so those are the, you get into those two basic different religious viewpoints and, and we go from there and, we, and <laughs> our whole life is set up like that and everyone yes is yeah way you know and then and then in christianity you get into this thing of we must convert the entire world into this one belief and and in in the history of that happening um among certain celtic people uh, and not just celtic people but among certain people those monks and priests who came in to convert people were put to death mm. that was the smart thing <laughs> in some way but you know um but we see what hap has happened in mm. these conversions the suppression of the goddess the suppression of of um, women controlling their own lives, their own being, um, a part a true relationship between men and women and women, adults and children. One that's one that's uh, relational this way rather than this way. Mm. Uh, so that mm. so that power is this way and not this way. Exactly, vertical instead of horizontal. Right, right. With, the main relationship with the goddess, and then the goddess as human beings, and now we are having people that are then the main god in our life or goddess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so all of the, all of that. The, that whole story is all found not just in the words, mm. but that the words reflect the history and and the mythology. Uh, and I do want to say that I use the term mythology not to mean something that is not true. Mm. That's not what mythology mm. is. Mythology. Mm. Um, Mythology is those stories or narratives that have purpose. And one purpose is that it explains natural phenomena. Another purpose is that they can explain a culturally based, uh, teach the children of that culture what that culture believes is right and wrong, good and evil. Another purpose is it is embodied in what we call the heroine's journey or the hero's journey, in which you learn how to be, be 
you're guided in how to be your true self, your true authentic self, so that that's how you live, no matter what you're, where you find yourself. And then, then the fourth purpose, and it's in no particular order, but another purpose is that more spiritual one that helps us kind of understand the spiritual that's beyond our rational ability to understand. Mm -hmm. And so these stories are true. It's mm -hmm. just that they're not true on the rational, um, on, on the rational scientific method level. They are true on, on the, the more spiritual, internal psychological level. So when I speak about mythology, that's, that's the way in which I'm speaking about it. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so beautiful. So important. And we are in this journey really to reclaim a healthy myth, the reclaiming of a healthy myth. And, and that's so important because if we don't have a healthy myth, then we're going to hold on to the old unhealthy myths. Like we rather have a yes. wrong identity than no identity at all. That that's too scary. So then we just <laughs> hold on to what we know, even though it's painful and terrible and disempowering. But that's all we know, and it's better to hold on to that than to not hold on to anything stable. And that that is where it's come so important to learn about the story and and adapting a new healthy myths and heroines and heroes. And, Yes, and, of, and as I have learned about these, it, from the very beginning, when I started following what I was thinking about, from the very beginning, I found this knowledge to be so refreshing. Mm. So like, wow, you know, what happened? <laughs> we, we have to know about this. And, and, and that, yes, this is the, the healthy... A healthy mythology and so so you know i'm trying to help bring it forward so that it's there to be claimed and and to help us each find our own authentic core selves and to live that mm. and that we have that we have that support yeah thank you so much for speaking up and sharing your wisdom and and it requires a lot of courage, uh, like to be able to speak up and just say it as it is. <laughs> it you know, I, that, I think that's, that's, that's part of who I truly am. I just, mm -hmm. that, that's how I am. It's, it's like, no, I'm not going to not talk about this. No, I need to put it out there. People need to know about it. And it's and it's nice because I'm not the only I'm not the only person doing that. So mm. it's I mean your school helps to do this among mm. other among other uh, things, and we have writers like <clears throat> excuse me uh, like Maureen Murdoch, mm. uh, Merlin mm. Stone, Maria Gimbutas. There are all kinds of of anthropologists, archaeologists, mythologists, historians who have looked into the past and bringing it forward. And it, and it is, it's very important for us to know mm. where we really come from and, and, and to incorporate it in, in mm. our current lives. Yeah. Because yeah. even if you may be thinking that well, it's not happening now, it actually is like it can feel like this was happening 300 years ago or 200 years or thousand but when we really start to look at time time isn't really real <laughs> time is a concept and it's a construct and and it's what is is yes is, is yeah all, is, yes what, what is is all that has been and the stories that have been told and and now we got to reclaim and adapt the story that is an empowering story. And so many people have gone away from anything other than what they know through their five cents organs. So how many people have lost their connection to anything other than like what is seen, heard, smelled, tasted, and touched? And that fundamental relationship to the goddess, we need it as a human, as a being, we need to have a relationship. Yes. And, and, and so if we don't look into this story and see how it has been, what's the truth really, I cannot find trust. So then I cannot reestablish that 
that the rap that that rapture of that that core relationship that that we have, which is not even a relationship, right? It's that's also the ignorance that we think we're separated from her, which we are not, but <laughs> it feels like yes, it. It definitely. Yeah. Like it. <laughs> and, yeah, and you know, and and part of that sense of of at feeling <clears throat> separated. Mm. It's not just from her, but we then we also are separated from ourselves. Mm. And and um and even have been taught to to stay that way because somehow as as women um we're not deserving we're you know daughters of eve and therefore from the very beginning which is not the very beginning <laughs> um yeah i mean you know the the hebrew priests of the time that that me that was their beginning story um but but you know the egyptian culture had already existed for thousands of years um cu cultures basically around the equator of the globe had already been existing for thousands of years mm -hmm. and when the priests come in and they start writing about genesis they're just like the Johnny come latelys they were just sort of the later the latest version and and felt uh, when they came into when they were coming into the Middle East where there were these other cultures that had already been there for thousands of years and they were conquering them and they felt at any moment they were going to be overwhelmed themselves then they create this whole thing of mm -hmm. um of um Yahweh was his name and originally he was just one tribal god among the Hebrews and his so there was this infighting between the priests of the different tribal gods until this one these priests somehow won the fight and Yahweh became the primary god of the Hebrew peoples um and so when they're moving into these areas they establish this mythology that supports what they're trying to do. And then a lot of, uh, so there's a lot of men in the, among them who aren't married and they're taking women, they're, they're, they're intermarrying with women who are living there, but they, they are members of matriarchal culture. And so now the Hebrews need to control their wives mm. with these stories and to get them to come away from from their their world view and and so you see that in the old testament how that's destroyed mm. how it is suppressed mm. yeah and more of this so uh, <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yes. So here we are. We're trying to rise. We're trying to recover. You know, reclaim, rise into our being, and and who we rightfully are, um, and to get through thousands of years of being told we're something we are not. Thank you so much. It's so <laughs> wonderful, and I can't wait for our for more we're also going to have you again you will come again for more davis voice and other play yes. session also as part of our heart offering to our community but you will also be part of our rising which which i'm so grateful for that you will share your knowledge and and just maybe to end on this note like i you know you said that you're writing a book also on the conquered feminine on the, the, the dissertation is it you're in the project of converting it into the book now yes yes what i'm what i'm doing is of course as a dissertation that's academic writing and and it's for academics yeah. uh, so what i'm doing is i'm rewriting it to be um more accessible to 
to a wider audience that um, that I feel is hungry for this information. Yeah. I, I really do feel that whether people know it or not, they are hungry for this information, which is something I discovered when I was teaching mythology in high school, is yeah. that mm -hmm. high school students were hungry for this mm -hmm. um, because it touches something inside of us that's not touched otherwise. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, I'm in the process of doing this rewrite that makes it uh, less Beautiful. academic, but as accurate. Mm. We are so hungry. So, so. Like, one of the best way to teach is through stories. Yes. We need to rewrite. We need to publish. We need to rewrite or, or just reclaim the stories of Hansel and Gretel and, and the one with the red. Yes. Like, they're all beautiful, empowering stories, which all have been distorted. And I know you know so much about yes. those stories, how they all have been also Distorted. Yes, and I will touch. Yeah. I will touch a little bit on fairy tales, the witch yeah. in fairy tales. I will touch a little bit on that in in on May eighth. Yeah. So, so we can see that. Exciting. <laughs> Exciting. So we got all. We all gonna look forward to the book, and then hope we're gonna do a book. And I'm Which looking I'm forward to it. I'm yeah. looking forward as well. How wonderful! Is there anything else you would like to share with us? Here in um, you know, moment. no, this is pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Mm, thank you so much, Dr. Shari. It's such an honor and I can't wait to have you back. Uh, I just take a few minutes thank here to yeah, share and invite everyone to our Rising Witch, a two months online course that is coming up on May 7th. It's going to be for two months. We meet three three times a week with some special mistress. I also all about words. I don't call them master classes because I want to reclaim the word mistress as well. <laughs> yes, me too. I do the same thing. I, I I'm becoming the. I am gaining mistressy, not mistressy. mastery, but mistressy. Exactly. Mistressy. I love that. I haven't used that one yet. Mistressy. Yes. <laughs> and where. We're going to go into, I connected this topic very much to the sexuality because so much of the suppression of the feminine is really in regard to our natural, sensual, erotic, pleasurable expression, which like, again, most of us did not ever have a healthy sex education. Most of us learned when it comes to intimacy, what we learned from pornography or Playboy magazine or very, very limited resources. And so I know even if we feel we haven't had a, a terrible trauma, what all, in all these years, what I've seen and based on the way we were raised, I think we all are sexually traumatized to a certain extent, really, because yeah. if we're born as sinners, how can we not? That, that which is most sacred and the most natural desire has been shamed and suppressed and and not honored in any way. And that's what we're, it has led us today among all the reasons we, along with all the reasons we just discussed you know, of history, but the suppression of the feminine is very much the sexual suppression of our, of our nature. And so in the rising, which there's a big focus to really help us reclaim our sacred sexuality, the way I like to call it, to return to a, sacred sexuality to return to our dignity our inherent digni dignity and be able to fully step into our into our erotic sacred pleasurable being and so that is one big aspect another one is where elisa our beautiful italian witchiness ayurvedic scholar will share with you the gifts of mother nature because the witch is all about her sacred connection with mother nature and she will teach us how to be really one with the elements and how to receive the resources from mother nature and use them not abuse or misuse them but use them for our healing for our empowerment for prevention we learn how to make tinctures how to make medicate medicated oils how to make oil essence uh, we will study about minerals so there's so many beautiful uh, gifts and secrets that are gonna gonna be shared how to create a natural apothecary 
And then we have Veta Lisboa, our Brazilian witch, who is going to bring all her knowledge with the wisdom of trauma, and especially designed for this course, focusing a lot on the sexuality. So how to really be trauma informed while we reclaim our sexuality so that we can step into our full witchy potential. And then we have Dr. Shari, who is here and bringing the whole or a big part of the story of her story to see what is the myth that we grew up with and what is a healthy myth that will really empower us in becoming a, a wounded healer or an embodied healer. It's really the reclaiming our natural healerness, healer goddessness, healer mistress, mistressy that is there inherent in all of us. So a very, very rich course, uh, two months course. And if you're here today, you can have sign up for a very special discount. So you can use the coupon, which, which gift, I will post it in the comment, um, which gift 555, and then you have a very special discount for a limited time to join our Rising Witch and Body Healer course. And if you have any question, as always, you can reach out to me and to my amazing, most beautiful Be Woman team. And we're so happy to answer all your questions. So with this, I'm gonna go, <laughs> we're gonna go, wishing you a, a wonderful morning or day or night, wherever you are from all around the world. We have the grace to connect here through the gift of technology. And one more time, thank you so much, Dr. Shari for being here with us and see you very soon again. Oh. Oh.